never in my wildest dreams did I think we could lose the whole company. Never, never could, would I think something like this could happen. You can't, you know, or else you couldn't come to work. I knew a large number of members were gonna be dead. I knew that a large number of civilians were going to be dead. I just didn't think it was gonna be all my guys. If you were working in a rescue company that day, you died. I can't replace their experience. I can't replace their knowledge. Each one of those men had a, uh, a uniqueness to them. I think the guys that were lost were heroes, but they were heroes before then. They weren't heroes because of the World Trade Center. They were heroes because they stood in front of the mayor and put their right hand up and said they'd be a firefighter. Brooklyn's rescue company, too, is called whenever a civilian or firefighter is in trouble. There are only five rescue companies in New York City, one for each borough. They are the most senior firefighters in the city, specially chosen to be part of this elite team. Their job is to save lives using their equipment, experience and skill. Time to go to work again. We'll be there in a few seconds. At this scene, a man has stumbled out of a burning building. He's told a plainclothes officer that his mother is still trapped upstairs. Phil, get to the top floor up here. We got a report of somebody uh, trapped. Hulk's up top. Give me a shot. We got heavy fire out there. We got two windows, guys. We're going to power up here. Johnny, you got to give me one more shot, baby. Come on, man. All right. I'm trying to hold control of the door. Are you going to get this? Their first priority is to find the woman. But the room is filled with thick smoke. They vent the windows to clear the air. Everything's by feel. It's quick. You can usually find a body real fast. Ten four. No one is found inside. The next priority is to deal with the fire that's quickly consuming the building. I hear fire. There's always an unknown. There's always a curveball. Fire can hide behind a wall, above a ceiling, or inside a shaft. That shaft back here, it's free burning. We've got to get water in it. It's in this. Anybody see fire? Right here. Tommy! I think that's what you see from outside. Open up the side wall, Tommy! You got a lot of I can see it. There you go, there you go. There it is on the ceiling, too. As other firemen arrive with a hose, the members of Rescue 2 direct them to the blaze. And the fire is put out. Responsibility for this rescue company is a demanding position. My name is Captain Phil Rovolo. 23 years, New York City Fire Department, third generation. I'm the company commander, 
rescue too. And it just went on its merry way. It went out that back door, and it so it went up the stairs. It's a feather in my cap. It's the the ultimate command. Good job. I'm gonna see you later. <laughs> to be here. Uh, the deputy chief said the son, who was in the ambulance, said his mother was on the top floor. You know, they think their relatives still in the building, but they're not. They've gotten themselves out, but they don't know that. We tossed the place three times. She wasn't there. Nobody got any boo-boo, so we're all going back to the quarters safe and sound. A strong bond exists between a captain and his driver or chauffeur. The two of you are up in the front. He's most likely the senior man in the company, closest to you in experience. My chauffeur is Bob Gallion. He inherited me. I was here before he got here. He chose to keep me. We've become good friends. There are times we don't even have to exchange words. I know you're hungry. <laughs> I was born, raised, educated, you know, grew up in the borough of Brooklyn. This is where I learned how to be a fireman. It's where I learned how to be a man. If you want to be a banker, you work in Wall Street. You want to be a fireman, you work in a ghetto. This is the area where the, the fires are. And fire. There's a lot of them. And this is the place to be. Heavy fire outside. With so many older wooden framed buildings and tenement houses, Brooklyn is notorious for its fires. But the firemen are trained in a wide range of other life-saving operations. All the men are hand-picked by the captain. Men who have had years of experience and who he feels will live up to the rescue company's high standards. Standards set by Ray Downey, the most decorated firefighter in New York City. A former captain at Rescue 2, he built the companies into the highly trained teams they are today. We get young guys, we get older guys. The one thing that they all have in common is heart and balls. Everything else we could teach you. Lincoln, get his head. Our most important job, our number one job, is to make sure that other firemen who might get in trouble get safely out of the building. It shows time and time again when there is a fireman hurt, you know, we'll drop everything and go right to the fireman. He had that sixth sense. He knew where to be, what to do. Lincoln was a high maintenance guy around the firehouse. He was always into something whether it was using the torch, the grinder, you know, he, he was into everything. And, and there was always a big smile on his face. You know, I've been known to be a little grumpy around the firehouse every now and then. It's like picking up after your kids. But, you know, after a little while, Lincoln will get you to crack a smile, or, you know, he'll, he draws you in. Lincoln loved going to fires. This is where we excel. We got that. Is that confirmed? Confirmed, Charles. The guy's up 50 stories. Rescue one, third and five, five on the way. Because of all the tall buildings, Manhattan's Rescue One has to deal with different challenges from its counterpart in Brooklyn. He's 50 stories up! On this day, they've been called to save two workers dangling off some scaffolding. Paul Hashagen, and I've been a rescue one for 19 years. I drive the truck, one of four chauffeurs, regular drivers. Cross down's always worse. Get off the road! And I have the honor of driving the captain. Hey guys! Yeah! You hear that? The guy out the window on the aerial ladder, maybe from a truck. My grandfather was a firefighter. And when I was a youngster, I got a few model fire trucks, and one of them was a rescue truck. And I asked him what that truck did. He says they rescue firemen. 
Let's help a little bit here. And I kind of knew right then what I wanted to do. Well, it's an amazing city, so there's plenty of people that live here and tourists that come visit. Have a nice night. Any way anybody can get themselves stuck in something or stuck under something or fall into something or have something fall onto them, then they call us. The rescue vehicle clears the traffic and heads on to the next job. Today, Dennis Mojica is leading the operation. When you respond to an emergency, you're really thinking about, you know, what tools do I need to bring? What other tools might I need? What things might I have to do? It's really, you know, a problem-solving thing when you go out the door. We ride on a big toolbox. The men are hanging 500 feet off the ground, held only by their safety lines. The name of the game here is getting up to the position. The biggest problem in the city with all these high-rise buildings is the exact location. Dennis Mojica is an extremely experienced fire officer, extremely dedicated to his men. We're able to lower them to the scaffold. The scaffold can't move up or down, so we got to get access to the scaffold to get them out. Roof. Lieutenant Mojica sends one of his men to the roof to lower a radio to the scaffold. Just make sure they have two safety lines on these guys and then tell them to hold off, don't do anything else. Do you hear me out there, guys? Come on, come on. What's your name? Uh, Mike. Mike, what's your name? Jimmy. Jimmy, what's your name? What's your name? Jimmy. Jimmy. All right, listen, we're taking out the glass now. We're waiting for them to clear the street, make sure uh, nothing uh, falls outside or out into the street below us. Once it's clear, They'll put a, give you a little slack on the roof, and then uh, we'll just guide you guys in. Everybody's okay. Nobody's got any kind of uh, medical attention that they need taken care of. No, just my pride. <laughs> just your pride. We can help you with that. <laughs> the men start the delicate process of removing the window. Just the pride. So, uh, for your information, we'll be taking out that corner window on the corner of uh, five five and third. The scaffolding has been stabilized, for now. But Lieutenant Mojica worries it might slip again. Using a special saw, the rubber holding the glass in place is cut away. So we waited for the street to be cleared below, because if the glass should break and we're that high, numerous people could be injured if not killed. Uh, rescue one to division. Uh, we're ready to, to pull the window in, if you give us the order. The only thing that Dennis did was sweat. He didn't really raise his voice or anything, but he was a sweater, but that was his metabolism. Okay, you can start taking a shot, please. Oh, okay. You couldn't fluster him. Just come up on this side. For the rescuers, this is the most dangerous part. They've been roped in to prevent them being pulled out of the window through air pressure. Support the glass. All right, I got you. Come on down. Slack on the line. Hold on, let me take Got it, got it. Right down. I got it. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Come on in, Jimmy. Thank you, gentlemen. Are oh, you like hanging out over there? Uh, rescue the roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, disregard, disregard. Yeah, okay. All right, Jimmy. Come on in there. You in. How you doing there? All right. Uh, rescue one incident command. The two guys are uh, in the building. Uh, good job. Thank you. You're welcome. What, you know what actually happened? It was going down fine, and all of a sudden it just kicked into overdrive. I disconnected the, the electric. It kept on going. Press the stop kept on going. We had the secondary. It kept on going. You frequent flyer miles. Yeah. <laughs> there was only two workers on uh, the scaffolding at the time of uh, the incident and uh, they're both refusing medical attention. Yeah, just, just, just sore throat, that's all, from yelling. <laughs> okay, I'll meet you guys uh, downstairs. Gentlemen, take care, man. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, appreciate it. Thank yeah, hey. All right, you got everything? All right, sorry for the, uh, for, for, for the mess. Guys, thank you very much. All right, no problem. Thank you, guys. Another day at the office. You never can tell. It's, that's what makes it so exciting. It could be a quiet day, a quiet night, or all hell can break loose and you could be running around, you know, for the rest of the day or the rest of the night.
I think Mark Twain said New York City would be a real nice place if they ever finished it. And uh, I don't think they ever will. If you go through Manhattan these days and just look around at everybody that's up on a scaffold or a sidewalk shed, all the construction that's going on, we do a, quite a bit of construction accidents. Rescue One. Rescue One has gone to the aid of a construction worker whose stomach has been punctured by a piece of metal. 1084, we have a construction worker injured. He's being lowered by crane to the street at Dyer and 4-1. We've got an abdomen injury, guys. Give me a... Who's addressing, right? Got it still in there? All right. O2, please, gentlemen. O2. All right, John, keep your hands there. Give me your inclusive dressing here, guys. Let's watch for the puncture wound. All right? Um, we're just going to put this on to help you breathe, all right, to make you feel a little bit better. All right? All right. After we get the inclusive dressing on him, let's get him on the board and do a further assessment. All right? Well, every captain I had the privilege of working with here he was a, a fine down fire down officer right and a great Gary, guy. Gary. But there was something special about Terry, the motivational level that he brought here. He slid down a uh, plywood that broke and rebar punctured his abdomen. There's no impalement, all right? We have an occlusive dressing on it. He's conscious, and we're getting vitals on him now. Not only was he the man for the job, but you could tell that it wasn't 40 hours a week with Terry. It was his life. He uh, strived day and night to uh, always be one step ahead of like the next emergency. He was a scholar when it came to fires. He wanted to figure out everything he could about each individual fire and what we could do to prepare ourselves for anything that could happen. Pop the glass, get the main door open. Terry Hatton is drilling Rescue One members on the roof of a loft building. When you pop the elevator door here. Mm -hmm. Captain Hatton was FDNY 24-7. He was probably the most intense person I've ever met in my life. Because if you stick your head in here and a fireball rolls up the stairs, you're going to get cooked. Mm -hmm. So if you do your leg or your tool, what do I got here? Okay, turtle up. Nobody's going to do this unless they turtle up. Everything, every aspect of this job and what we do as rescue firefighters, he was well versed in. He knew everything about the tools. He knew a tremendous amount of information. Look at your egress. Can you very easily get on the roof of this sure. and be out of the game? Safe. Two. Here it is. Everybody go to two. As Everybody Captain Hatton's go. class ends, he reminds his men of the rescuer's most important task, ensuring the safety of their brother firefighters. And we're the last guys off the roof. And this way you can confirm that everybody's off. Because somebody's going to ask you, is everybody off the roof? Yeah. He was a cosmopolitan kind of guy. He knew all about Manhattan. And I had been driving Rescue One for quite a long time. And I had been in the company, I guess, 16 years or so before he got here. And I thought I knew the city pretty well. And we'd take off, and he would tell me back routes to take that I never would have thought of. He read the New York Times and the financial areas, not for what the stocks were doing, but what the financial aspects of the city was doing to the building construction. He, he studied every facet of the city as it related to firefighting, and I don't think he missed a trick. Tell the guy, take him out, put him on the board, and then we'll put him in the stretcher. Stay down. Stay down. He told me once, anytime we go to an operation, to treat whoever's involved, trapped, injured, dying dead, like they're your family. And uh, that's the way we operate. These guys are good at what they do. So yeah, they want to do it. My guys want to go to fires. You're fighting a, a, a force of nature. You win most of the times. And the rush that you get can't be replaced uh, by anything else. Everybody now! Being a flyman for us here in rescue is not what you do, it's what you are. We live to go to fires. We live to go to emergencies. We live to help people. That's what we like to do. The bigger the fire, the better, as long as everything comes out all right. A 
van parked between two houses has caught fire and the flames have ignited both buildings. Rescue 2 arrives as the chief at the scene reports large volumes of fire and extreme heat. An easy way to describe it is close your eyes, turn the oven on to about 500 degrees, wait till it warms up, and then open the oven. All right, the blast of heat that you feel is really our work environment. Everything up there is plywood. This entire attic is plywood. We gotta find the stands going up to the attic. You're in unfamiliar territory. You really don't know what you're in because it's not your house, it's not your apartment. You might be getting somebody trapped in the rear, and uh, you gotta get to the rear. But it's sort of like going into a maze because, you know, where is the rear? You get tunnel vision. Things start narrowing in. You're just concentrating. Everything is narrowed down to what's going on between your two hands. Wooden-framed buildings can burn for only so long before they collapse. Captain Ravello knows he must either extinguish the fire fast or pull his men out completely. You just, you know, you try to stay calm and, and use your head and use your instincts. Your heart's pumping and your mind's racing. Is there a floor in and the adrenaline's going on top of everything else. Your back might have been hurting 20 minutes before, but right now you, you can lift 400 pounds. It's on the wheel, all right? It is really hot. How hot is it? Is it getting hotter? You know, that's telling you something. You're hearing crackling, okay? You know, it's, it's over here, as opposed to hearing, you know, a roaring sound like a train coming. Uh-oh. If fire reaches the top of the house, it can quickly spread to the adjoining buildings and engulf the whole area. A fire doubles in intensity every 30 seconds, unless you're doing something to control it. And sometimes things get really bad. I I think most firefighters don't like the word scary, but yeah, it's scary as hell. The plywood attic burns at a very high temperature, pinning the men down in the hallway below. If I'm on the fire floor, there's another guy that I know he's there. He might not be next to me, he's not holding my hand, he's doing his job also, but in this company, you're never alone. They struggle up the stairs and finally reach the attic where the fire is raging. They've contained the fire and saved the houses surrounding the building. Good job. Good job. It's a good job. <laughs> Top floor. Plywood ceilings, those above us. Tough to vent. Tough to get a good hole for the, uh, the engine to give it a good shot. It took a shellacking up on the top. A lot of heat, heavy smoke. A lot of fun. It was fire from the front door right through to the back. Very nice. Good time. A civilian would say, oh, that was a bad fire. The, the way we would describe that is being inside of a good fire. All nice orange Nozzleman's dream. A little play on words, but that's the way we look at it. You know, oh, that was a, that was a good job. You know, you had three floors of fire, you know, 15 rooms. That was, that was a good job. We had too much fire back there for too long. I think that all the guys respect the fire and they understand that it's dangerous. It's a real dangerous job. Bang, bang, oh. bang. <laughs> everyone has to do their job, everyone. If everyone does their job, things usually go smooth, usually. Sometimes you can do everything right and things don't go right. It's just the nature of the business. Most of these rescue firemen work 24-hour shifts, spending long stretches away from home. So you, you all stressed now? You, 
starting to wind down. I had a great day. You good? We live like one third of our lives in a farmhouse together. Sometimes I think I spend more time with the guys than uh, I do with my wife and uh, at home. Hold it! Shut it down! If you have a personal problem, guys will help you out. If you have something done in your house, guys will help you out. And that's what I love about the job. The guys make the job. This place is a big stop. Look at all this dirt. Did you get the Yankee calendar I left in your box, Bob? Yes, I did, my brother. I had to fight Driscoll off for you. The good son. Oh. Uh -huh. John was known as the good son. John was the captain's first new man. The captain made sure that John got to learn what it is that we should know. How's the baby doing? Yeah? yeah. Sleeping okay? Everything goes through the kitchen. You come in in the morning, you have to get a cup of coffee, you gotta go in the kitchen. Coming in the afternoon, you have to find out what was going on that day, what jobs we went to, did we learn anything that day, got to go in the kitchen. All the ball breaking goes on in the kitchen. Why is the good son the good son? All right, without me saying a word. When you sit down in the kitchen, you're up for grabs. It doesn't matter if you're the new kid or the senior man. It's a great equalizer. Now, does it the third? That's where justice gets meted out. Strike three! It's <laughs> the center of the firehouse universe. We talk about the jobs that uh, uh, scare the crap out of you. How much fire was behind you? How much fire was in front of you? Where's the basement? I think I'm going into the basement. No, you're on the first floor. Yeah, maybe I could have pressed a little bit further on that one. This was an interesting maybe I should have held back a little bit more on the, on the hill. It's how the young kids hone their craft. They listen to them. Everybody else talking. Right, they have eight, I would say eight to ten seconds. I think the doors stay open before they close. The fire's in the lot. It's not in the box. <laughs> it's not in the box. I mean, come on, the chairs, man. I'm just saying. Everything is held in tremendous irreverence to the delight of all. Everybody stay on top. HVAC system's on. Stay safe. So you're down in the dumps, come in the kitchen and get hammered for a while by guys you really love, and uh, then you understand. And then it's, uh, you know, everything's all right. Uh, there's some things we see in life that normal people should never see. The one place I always want to be after that is in the kitchen. The kitchen's a great place to uh, forget what's really haunting you. Another point that always happens is uh, once the victim is brought to the surface, everybody forgets about the rescuer. You know, they Kevin's probably <laughs> the nicest guy in this firehouse. He's probably one of the nicest men on the New York City Fire Department. You go outside it's nice to be around while he was around. <laughs> but he was also a very aggressive fireman. Can I get in that room over there, boss? An electrical fire that started in a shop has spread to the flats above. Kevin O'Rourke heads to the floor above the fire. Even though you couldn't see him, you can picture the smile on his face from ear to ear. <laughs> he'd be bouncing around in there like a little kid, you know, and like I said, he'd bump into somebody, oh, excuse me, you know, pardon me. Let me slip by you, please. You know, it's not the way it's always verbalized inside a burning building. Excuse me, Chief. Thank you. Got it, guys. Oh. Need a hand on top of your team? All right. Close your door. Don't go too deep. OK, boss. As Rescue 2 searches above the fire, Kevin notices that the floor is starting to give way. We got holes. There's holes on the, in the back, yeah. A lot of holes here, brother. Just as he starts to warn everyone, he falls through. Oh, the floor! Oh, and is left dangling above the fire. The other men act immediately and are able to grab him and lift him out. Thank you. I'm all right. After rescue two reports that the top floor is clear, the chief pulls everyone out. Possibility of it coming across on the top floor. You all right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Sure? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> How do you know when it's time to go? When the heat drives you into the floor, when the fire's surrounding you. The cap says, hey, we're getting out of here. Okay, fine. No, I'll go. I'm just going to say, hey, listen. Let's go. I don't want to die yet. It's hard to tell a fire when it's time to go. It means that you quit, you gave up, and you don't want to. It's your responsibility to make sure, as a captain, that they're not risking their lives for naught. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, the floor gave way uh, on the second floor. I ended up stepping into the hole. And it just kept getting bigger. I ended up uh, spread eagle holding onto the beams, you know, until uh, the brothers were kind enough to pull me uh, over onto the solid floor. No, I never say you really talk about the fear. You joke about the fear. You joke about what you do. You joke about, you know, uh, whew. Duck that one this time. I said, as long as I swing down, you know, I'm only going to be like four or five feet off the floor. To, you know, to drop, to drop down if I had to. I have the strength of my brothers. Well, luckily I didn't have to. <laughs> to do what I have to do. There's still fear. You still think about it. But you know you have to do it. You're a fireman. You are a brother to each other. It's proved to you on a daily basis, and you prove it to the other guys on a daily basis that I can be trusted with your life and I trust mine to you. These guys are going to die for me if they have to. They can, one way or another, they're coming for me. We don't always like each other, but there is a love there and it's always going to be there. I mean, if you're willing to risk your life for another man, you better love him a little bit. At 8.48 a.m. on the 11th of September 2001, an alarm was sounded for Box 8087, the World Trade Center. Eleven men responded from Rescue 1, seven from Rescue 2. From our quarters, if you look, you, you used to be able to see the towers. I'm sure as the door went up and they pulled out of quarters, they got a good look. You know, they had a good idea of the conditions there at that time, the first building that was hit. They had extra guys riding that morning. Unfortunately, the job came in at the change of tours. So not only do we have the night tour, but we had the day tour as well. Realizing the significance of the alarm, I think everybody that was in the firehouse just ran and jumped on the truck. You got a full truck load of people racing down to that site because every, all, all firefighters wait for the big one. And that was one of the big ones, not realizing what was gonna happen later, but the significance of the amount of people that were trapped and what you could do to try to save them. You just go, you go because you know you're supposed to go and you know that that's what you know how to do. This is the Super Bowl fire. This is, this is the big one. They responded through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. They were able to get out of the tunnel, pull up onto West Street, and when they made that turn, you know, they saw the tower burning the way it was. One of the commissioners who was responding in through the tunnel walked up with them to the building. She's told us that the guys were, you know, joking around, you know, laughing, giggling. Even though you might be busting each other's chops, the seriousness of the situation was obviously in every guy's mind. And they hit the stairs and they just started going up. You know, they were bent on getting to that fire floor. I knew they had a real good fire, and I thought that that's all it was going to be. Just a real good fire, and one of those things that they were going to talk about you know, for years to come. Well, I was at the big one, the World Trade Center, when the plane hit. And as I watched and the second plane hit, I realized this was an act of terrorism and I took off, as I think just about every other fireman in the city did. He saw across the bottom of the screen, it said breaking news and big, thick, black billowing smoke and it said lower Manhattan. So I said, oh, look at that, the brothers got a good job. And then it panned out. 
and I saw the World Trade Center. And I got probably one of the sickest feelings I've ever gotten in my life. I saw the, the amount of fire and, and the, what was going on, and I just said to myself, oh my God. They were going to be on a fire floor. They had been there for quite a significant amount of time already. So it would have been a hard climb, but they would have made it. They'd be on the fire floor fighting fire. And I was trying to judge from my position how many floors of fire that they were faced with. And I was just shaking my head at the enormity of the whole thing. There were upwards of 35,000 people in those buildings when the first plane hit. They were heading up you know, to make sure that that fire went out. We have to go in there. We have to get those people out. We're firemen. You can't stand outside and say, wow, that looks really bad. I say it with nothing but pride in my voice. I mean, I know where they were going. And everybody here knows where they were going. And uh, that's the way I like to say, when is it, when, when is it time to leave? It, it just isn't for us. As long as there's a fireman in that building, we're not leaving. It's the rescue's mission. And, uh, and we're going to live it. I mean, and, and, and that's it at any cost. And unfortunately, you know, it was the greatest cost that time. The men off duty that day first reported to their fire stations and then made their way together to the World Trade Center. Bobby Gallion was here first, then me, and then guys just started coming. And we understood the magnitude of what was going on. When we left here, we were well aware that one building had already come down. Human nature is that you're going to turn around and uh, you're getting out of that building, man. The other building's down. It's just a matter of time for you. When yours is coming down, you already know the other building's down. It's not a secret. Um, they never turned around. And if you're ever going to get scared, yeah. You know what? That's total fear right there. But you also know that you signed on for this deal. You know what I mean? There's firemen in trouble, and you're going. And you hope for the best, but you keep climbing. We were able to commandeer a city bus. They happened to be riding down the block. The, the bus driver was good enough to ask the other passengers on the bus to get off, and she got us to within a block and a half of the Trade Center. And on the way, the, the building collapsed. Everybody wanted to come in including a retired member. And we uh, raced in here. The car that we were using, luckily had to, uh, we had to use jumper cables to get it started. And we raced in here, made pretty good time. We came to Rescue One's quarters to get our equipment. And then we got out to West Street and flew down there. And we were two blocks away running towards the building when it fell. If the car would have started right away, there'd be five more guys from Rescue One buried down there. Chief Downey was there from Special Operations. I remember saying to him, Chief, uh, you know, I know you're really busy, but we're here, we've got three guys from Rescue One here. If there's anything we can do for you immediately. And uh, he just shook his head and he says, uh, right now we think we're missing about 200 guys. So I want you to stand on that corner right there, and as soon as I can use him, I'm gonna put you to work. He just walked off into the cloud. You know, it was very calm, cool and collected as he always was. I don't know if he's ever been to an operation like this, but he uh, went off, he said he would come back for us, and uh, he never came back. We're missing 200 guys, but there was another fifth alarm assignment in the other tower. And he went in, and he met with the, with the chiefs there at the command post, and he was there getting them out. And those chiefs, uh, they didn't leave. They had men in the building, and they wouldn't leave without them. And they had time to get out, but they wouldn't leave their men. As you walked up the street, it was, it was dark. It was nighttime in the middle of the day. There was dust, there was smoke. Uh, it, it was difficult to breathe two blocks away. And as you worked your way towards West Street, which is to all of us that have lived here in the city, you know, the World Trade Center, yeah, it's over there on West Street. 
and you turned the corner onto West Street, it was out of the movies. It was, this was a movie set. This couldn't be for real. There was, there was four foot of water in the middle of the street. You were plodding through this water, and then now you started getting up to debris, uh, parts of the building. There, there were fire trucks on fire. There was engines on fire. There was police cars that were tossed around like they were potato chips. There was ambulances that were crushed. The private cars flattened like pancakes. And this is just still two blocks out. And, and just buildings on fire all over the place. It just, there's nothing that you've ever done in your life that could prepare you for what you saw when you turned the corner and actually got a look at what was there or what wasn't there. I had hooked up with uh, Captain Ruvalo and members of Rescue 2, and we tried for, I'd say, close to an hour to find different ways to get to where we thought they might be. There were voids that we looked, and before we went in, we may have said like a quick silent prayer, like, God, this doesn't look good. Let me get out of there. Give me the strength. We are all moving in different directions. Uh, trying to find the good void, you know, where the guys were, who was trapped. Quite a few has found a void by the hotel. And when we went into this void, we found a helmet, we found um, a handy talkie, a hook. And the hook looked like a, res a rescue two hook. And then I heard Captain Ruvalo on the radio, and I said, Cap, are all our guys accounted for? And there was a long pause and just a no. You were at the mercy of the group chart that day. Anything can happen on any given day. John. It was probably the, uh, my first proby, so to speak, coming into the rescue. Uh, someone that I, uh, I took a personal interest in, in training. And I was very, uh, very tough on him. And he uh, consistently rose to the occasion. Let's say we go home, John. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. John had no flaws. That's why he was the good son. The good son. Oh, the good son is back. He would have been uh, my choice to replace me. John, Lincoln, two new guys in the company, proved themselves, you know. Many times, probably, they proved themselves. He was great. I mean, Lincoln was, uh, I mean, he came out of a great company. I mean, uh, you know, like, our, our time for it, he was a ghetto fireman his whole career, you know? He was a very comfortable fireman. He had no problem with any scenario we faced. I mean, he was always, he was great at it. I'll go anywhere with him, not a problem. And usually he's in front of me. Lincoln be laughing right now. Standing around in his shorts and his uh, mock turtleneck uh, T-shirt that he wore all the time, making some crude comment about something, smoking a cigar, and uh, you know he'd be laughing and saying, you know, got to keep doing what we're doing. They're always with us. They're always with us. They're right over our shoulder, watching us every time we go out the door. Kevin and I were friends for about uh, 12 years. We had worked together in squad one. We have a fire one day. As we go up the stairs, the engine company is rolling down the stairs. The ceiling's collapsed. Uh, the engine company officer looks up and he says, one of my men is upstairs. We start to go up. I got on the radio, Kevin had the roof. I said, Kevin, I need a hole. Kevin knew that uh, the life of a fireman was dependent on getting a hole. He put on his mask, walked into the fire, 
got us a hole. And in the process, his light melted off of him. His face piece started to melt to his face. His coat burnt to a crisp. And he never once stopped until the hole was there. In our estimation, if Kevin didn't get that roof opened up when he did, um, that nozzle team and that, the guy on the nozzle probably would have died. So he, you know, directly saved that guy's life. And, you know, never once did Kevin mention that. He's a tough guy. Very aggressive, very knowledgeable, very good at what he did. He had tremendous compassion for the people that were around him. He was a very big family man, always concerned about your family, hoping things were going well at home. It could be 3 o'clock in the morning, and a kid could come looking for air in his bicycle, and Kevin would be outside giving him air, and then he'd give his bike a 10-point checkup. I wish I could lead my life the way Kevin you know, led his. I mean, he's, you know, Kevin was the ultimate family man. OK, I'll meet you guys uh, downstairs. Gentlemen, take care, man. <laughs> Dennis was a real good friend. I miss working with him. I miss going to fires with him. He was an easy man to talk to. We often had very lengthy conversations about things not even related to the job, about our private lives. And he was a close friend. And I miss... I miss not being able to talk to him anymore. Because somebody's going to ask you, is everybody off the roof? Yeah. All right. uh, captain Hatton will always be, uh, in some regard, the captain of Rescue One for all of us that, that uh, had the privilege of working with him. But there's no doubt in my mind that we will, the members that were fortunate enough to work with him, will maintain that, that intensity, that, that level of uh, dedication, and uh, pass that to the, to the new generation. I would like to have seen Terry have more time to to get a few more things in place. He, he certainly had a large vision of what he wanted, and he had made a life's work of studying this. He got a lot done in the short time he was with us, and he affected us all. And it's tough, it really is tough. But Terry would be the first one to say, we gotta go on. We can't sit around crying about this. We cry on your off hours, go to work. We got stuff to do. People count on us. There's a lot of people out there, and they count on us to come take care of their problems. I made a promise to myself that I would never, I would never leave a fire. I won't break that promise now. We got a phone call on the rig that they had uncovered one of our masks and that they were digging further, but maybe we should get down there. So we, we shot in, and uh, I was parking the rig. The guys took off. By the time I got up there, they uh, they had already uncovered Lincoln, put him in a in a Stokes basket, and they uh, they had him covered with a flag. And we carried him out. We went back in, and in the same area, we were fortunate that we were able to find Kevin. It took a while to free him up. Same thing, got him into a Stokes, covered him with a flag. Minister, priest, I'm not sure which it was, but it was, it was a man of the cloth, gave a blessing, and we, uh, and we were able to bring them home. Up until September 11th, it was a fantastic 19 years here. Got to work with some of the finest men in any occupation, any calling that there is. We get to make a difference on a daily basis. Firefighters always tend to believe that they're in control of the situation. Whether they are or not, we like to believe it is. 
a truth so that we can operate the way we do. But some things uh, we can't control, as we found out. My father put in 33 years. And every time he sees me, he tells me he's proud of me. And when are you gonna retire? I would be lying if I said I didn't contemplate it. I think everyone that was there contemplates it. It is gut-wrenching, you know, losing your friends like this. Make no mistake about it. It will give you pause to think about what the consequences are when you come to work. I know that this takes a tremendous toll on my family and every family. We're away long hours. The, the job itself is consuming. I tell them I'm good at what I do. I tell them that I make a difference. I know I've made a direct impact in saving lives. That's a big deal. I tell them it's more what I am than what I do. And they understand. This is still the best job on earth. It's a noble profession. It's a noble job, noble calling, whatever you want to call it. And if I had sons, there's nothing wrong with being a fireman. I have daughters. I will think of something else for them to do. But it's the best job on earth. There's nothing better than this. may have a pretty good contingency in heaven right now, but it's still the greatest job on earth for sure. Um, there's a, I mean, there's some good times that are gone. It's a big void, man. It really is. It's, uh, it's big emptiness. You cannot replace those seven men in this company, the 343 altogether. They cannot be replaced. They will not be replaced. They'll always be remembered. You replace a broken window. You don't replace a man. On the writing list on the chart, we have who's, uh, so we know who's on duty. I, it says still rotting because uh, we have members of this company we haven't found yet. And as far as we're concerned, they're, they're still responding. Still rotting is, is, is a show of respect to the guys that they're still, their spirits are still and will always continue to ride with us every time we go out the door. That first couple weeks, there was a lot of times when you got back here to the firehouse, you really wanted to, like, contemplate why you were doing what we were doing, you know? Why did I choose to do this? And then you sit down and read five or ten cards from some first graders, you know, with all the great misspell words, but you get the drift of what they were trying to tell you, or all the pictures, all the thoughts. There's still a little boy in each guy here, even though we've been through this great tragedy. And you find yourself telling a little joke, <laughs> laughing a little. It it's, it's starting. It's starting to come back. The healing process has probably already started. But I think what keeps us going is the fact there's still fires, there's still emergencies, there's still a lot of people out there need help. 
make the move. I lost 23 years worth of best friends. You got the Yankee calendar I left in your box, Bob? Yes, I did, my brother. I had to fight Driscoll off for it. Guys I was at their wedding with. Guys I broke in with. Guys I shared laughs with in the back room. Medium small condition, they got high CO readings. That was excellent. That was excellent. Yeah, that was excellent. Right down the slope, Jerry. Even I don't care if the fire is in the basement, I'm cutting the roof. The job will be fun again, but it'll never be as much. At least not for me. All of them would want us to do our job as well as we could do it. Why are you following us? We're the five hundred, not the hunks, we're the chumps. The five hundred chumps calendar, guys. So that's us. Come on, we'll get some chowder. Just because this happened, we can't change what we do. Because otherwise they win. We lose. We don't want to lose. We want to do our job. Now, the weather forecast with Becky.